The luna is shaped like the crescent moon. It consists of four articular surfaces and two non-articular surfaces. The four articular surfaces are the proximal, the lateral, medial, and the distal. And two non-articular surfaces are the dorsal and the palmar. It articulates proximally with the radius, laterally with the scaphoid, medially with the triquetrum, and distally with the capitate and the hamate. In this video, we're going to use a left specimen, and this hand model is that of a right. The proximal surface is large and convex, and articulates with the radius laterally and with the triangular articular disc medially. Rarely, a ridge is present to delineate the two sites. The luna articulates with the scaphoid laterally via a small, flat, crescent-shaped facet. Immediately proximal to this facet is a roughened area for the attachment of the interosseous ligament that binds these two bones together. The medial surface is flat and four-sided and is for the articulation with the triquetrum. The distal surface is biconcave for the capitate and the hamate. In some people, the distal surface is divided into two facets a larger facet for the capitate and a smaller facet for the hamate. The facet for the capitate is located adjacent to the facet for the scaphoid. And the facet for the hamate is narrow and curved and is located between the facets for the capitate and the triquetrum. The dorsal and the palmar surfaces are rough and non-articular and serve as the attachment sites for ligaments and for entry of nutrient vessels. The palmar surface is larger and is broad and roughly triangular shaped. There are several methods of determining the side. One of the easiest methods is to simply find the large concave deep facet for the capitate. So if you look at the bone in any orientation, you find that deep concave facet and that will be for the capitate. A immediately adjacent to that concave facet for the capitate is a facet for the scaphoid which will be small, thin, and semi-lunar shaped. So again, you're looking directly at the capitate facet. Next, you find that small, thin facet for the scaphoid. What you do is you simply put down the bone in which the capitate facet is still facing towards you, and now the scaphoid facet is down on the table, just like this. The triquetrum facet is going to point towards the side of the body the bone came from, meaning a right or a left. So in this case, with your scaphoid facet down, the capitate facet facing towards you, and the triquetrum facet facing left, you know that this is a left lunate. The lunate is almost entirely covered in articular cartilage, except at the dorsal and palmar regions, which makes these two regions the main areas where nutrient vessels can enter. In about 80% of people, the luna receives blood supply from both regions, and in about 20% of people, the blood supply enters from only the palmar surface. The vessels entering the bone can anastomose in a variety of patterns. Most people have a two, three, or four vessel anastomosis pattern. In those lunates with a single nutrient vessel, interruption of that vessel may lead to necrosis of the entire bone because there are no collaterals to compensate. So those people tend to have a poorer prognosis following a fracture than those people that have a dual blood supply. In lunates with a dual blood supply where anastomosis can occur, both the dorsal and the palmar vessels must be interrupted to cause an AVN or an avascular necrosis. I forgot to mention that the lunate has no muscle origins or tendinous attachments and this further limits its blood supply. Key box disease is an avascular necrosis of the lunate. Multiple risk factors and etiologies have been reported in the literature. Trauma, especially when the ligaments and vessels are interrupted, is one of the leading causes. Another cause is an increase in intraosseous pressure due to venous stasis, which is something that is not usually seen in the bones in the foot because a calf acts as a pump to push the blood back to the heart. Other risk factors include inflammatory conditions such as lupus and Crohn's disease. Also, some have found that having a negative ulnar variance can place greater shear forces on the lunate. Something interesting is that a negative ulnar variance is not necessarily a risk factor for Kienbach's disease in some Asian populations, such as the Japanese, 
these regions show less of a correlation. Over the years, anatomists have classified the lunae into different types, and one of the more famous classifications came about in 1966 by Zipico, who divided the lunae into three types. His aim was to find a correlation between the lunate morphology and ulnar variants and its relationship to Kienbach's disease. Later, anatomists had refuted his theory and found that there is really no correlation between the lunate type and the risk of Kienbach's disease. Another classification was by Viegas, and Viegas divided the lunate into two types, one that had a facet for the handmate and one that did not have a facet for the handmate. And Viegas found that those people in which a facet for the handmate existed, there was significant evidence of cartilage erosion at the proximal pole of the handmate. And one of the takeaway points from this finding was that the facet for the handmate is a variable trait.